Uh, thank you so much, Elena. Thank you very, very much for um, for having me. It's 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 really an honor. Um, so I thought I would spend a little bit of time talking about um, some of these issues with respect to medicine uh, to start off with. Let's see. Um, we can re download these slides. Sure. I'll go grab them. Yeah, and then, yeah, if you want to bring your laptop, yeah. so we can also connect it. All right. But this one doesn't have it at all. Oh, okay. screen it? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. 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 Oh,
what are we counting and who gets counted and how wide is the data that we're actually looking at? In economic terms, if we don't count things, that can lead to you know, omitted variable bias, but a very pernicious form. Now, this is uh, just a quote from a Brookings report, it should actually be 2021, about how bias in algorithms can emanate from unrepresentative or incomplete trading data, training data or the reliance on flawed information that reflects historical inequalities. So um, I wanna give you a specific instance of this. So I'll do now kind of take a, a pivot to a deep dive into a project that I've been working on for the last several months um, with some behavioral economists as well as um, people who really work in innovation. Now, um, we're gonna think about the R&D process in general. And it's kind of commonly known that innovation can actually exacerbate inequality. This is the sigmoid adoption curve that you're probably all very aware of. And there's different reasons why that might be the case. Innovation tends to skew towards developing technology for those who can afford them or for the majority group in general. In addition, diffusion often occurs more rapidly across those who are well-connected or well-educated, who have the information. And this is true across a wide variety of fields. But of course, in health, those inequalities can be very, very stark. If you think of, for example, antiretroviral therapy for, for HIV AIDS or even the vaccine technology um, for COVID-19. So keeping on this theme of representativeness, in this project, we actually explore a different dimension of innovation and inequality. And we asked, does the routine underrepresentation of certain groups from the R&D process contribute to disparities? And in particular, or put differently, you can just ask the question, does how a technology is developed affect who adopts it or who adopts it more readily? Now, we'll think about in this context and kind of consistent with some of the other work that I've done, we'll think about Black patients who are generally very underrepresented in the trials that support new drug applications for approval in the United States. Now, um, I think many are familiar with the very prominent racial and ethnic uh, life expectancy gaps that we have in the U.S. that have grown with COVID-19. But what is probably less commonplace is or commonly known is the fact that there's also pretty large gaps in, um, in the process. Let's see if this will work. Ooh, maybe. Um, I'm just gonna go there, sorry. Avert your gaze, <laughs> this is an important, um, this is important slide, so we have to get there. Okay, so this is showing the median um, percent black and the median percent white. Those are the dotted lines. Um, black is, is red and bl blue represents um, white. And you can, and representation generally requires some benchmark. For our purposes, we're using the population, uh, US population shares as the benchmark, but another natural benchmark would be disease burden, in which case a lot of these differences would be even more profound. So here what you're seeing is, um, that in fact, black individuals are about median 5% of the share enrolled in clinical trials since the FDA started actually tracking this um, uh, pretty regularly in 2015, and that's far below their population share. Um, on, the, on the other hand, white individuals are somewhat overrepresented relative to a population, and again, also a disease burden benchmark. On the right-hand side, you see if that's the inputs into the innovative process, which for clinical trials, patients are really the key input. On the right-hand side, you actually see prescriptions of new drugs. So here we have years that the drug has been on the market on the x-axis, and you can see that that disparity is sort of recapitulated and who's getting access um, to new medications. Now, those are the median. If you kind of prefer the CDF version of this, you can see the entire distribution um, it looks this very, uh, very dramatic in that regard too. So these buttons do not want to work. So we'll keep that in mind going forward. I'll be, I'll, I'll be sparse on my buttons. I'll use them only when absolutely necessary. Um, so, so again, we're going to focus on racial gaps. There are other gr 
gaps that do exist. For example, I could probably draw um, the same graphic for Hispanic individuals, um, though the data are not quite as um, readily available uh, given different ways that ethnicity has been coded. And actually for gender, things look quite um, equitable. In, across certain diseases, you can see um, lower representation or underrepresentation in certain conditions, but it's not in the main the same. And certainly the life expectancy gaps are, are very, very profound for AIAN and, and Black individuals. Now, firms and regulators are aware of these patterns. This is from Moderna. So Moderna in fall of 2020, if you'll remember, kind of made headlines because they actually slowed down their trials. And this is um, coming from the CEO who said that, you know, we really wanted to have the representation of the of the population that was being extremely burdened by COVID-19 at the time. Now, when they did make that announcement, and I won't show you the data, it's in the appendix slides, but their stock price dropped um, with those with that announcement, um, as you might guess that it did. They've been doing fine since, but um, the market did react to that news. Here's another more recent example in February of this past year from the FDA, where they actually decided not to approve a drug that had been tested a cancer checkpoint inhibitor that had been tested only in China. And they actually backtracked from a position they took even a couple years prior by saying that they'd heard from patient groups that this was just not going to uh, be acceptable, that people wanted to see uh, faces like theirs and that it was important to build confidence. And the last example um, that is actually from a, a physician. Uh, she's now the editor-in-chief of the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, and she writes that as a physician caring for patients in an urban safety net setting and wanting to provide the best evidence-based preventive care, I'd spend as much time on the science as I devoted to reinforcing with patients why they should still trust these guidelines and the process despite the unrepresentative populations in the evidence base. So this project is really about trying to, those are all sort of nice normative statements, but we're actually trying to explore the consequences and causes of the persistent underrepresentation of black patients from clinical trials. And does that actually have any effect on medical decision-making and the way people perceive and view that evidence? And so this is where I think it's broadly applicable to all of you here. So does, do representative data, does that actually matter? Uh, to physicians and patients? And if so, why, isn't, why aren't such data endogenously supplied by the market? So to address the first question, we're going to conduct survey experiments with physicians and patients. Well, we'll cross-randomize drug efficacy. So how well does that drug work with who's actually in the trial itself with the representation? And then we'll do a similar but a simpler exercise for patient respondents. To address the second question, which is like, well, if this is important, why isn't it being supplied? This is where we'll turn to our theoretical framework. And it's really based on this model of similarity-based extrapolation, basically, and it's actually quite Bayesian, to take more from the evidence base when you can see yourself in it. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't preview the findings. I'll just note that this is actually related to a long literature in economics on innovation and inequality, on um, mental models and how people learn and um, anal 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 analogies and how uh, people learn from memory, as well as uh, some of the work that I've done on medical care and discrimination. Okay, so just to say a brief word or two about the context. So new drugs have to be shown to be efficacious and safe by the FDA, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, before they are approved for sale. Now, usually um, this is a process by which they have to, usually pharmaceutical companies have to provide data from trials, um, trials done on patients to regulators to show that these drugs act um, better than the outside option. And the longest part of this process is actually recruiting and testing the drug on patients themselves. Um, now, what I didn't know before looking at these data um, from the clinical trials website is that the primary sponsor for many, meaning the primary funder for much of this research is actually private uh, firms. So there are about 40% of US regulated products are the primary funder is uh, pharma. 
And that's compared to 4% for funders like the NIH. Um, and then the residual 56% is coming from institutions, nonprofits, and other organizations. Um, even across, uh, within condition and across firms, what uh, funder types, we usually see that private firms tend to have a lower median share of black than, um, than other sources of funding. Now, it probably is not um, surprising to many in this room to know that the United States has an oversized uh, role in terms of uh, a for pharmaceutical revenues. We make up about 46% of the trillion dollar pharmaceutical revenue market. Um, that's because uh, we don't have any price regulation really to speak of. Of course, now with the Inflation Reduction Act, we might have a little bit. Um, on the cost side, you know, pharmaceutical firms will tell you that clinical trials are very expensive. And that again, this recruitment of patients is a key driver of these costs. In fact, um, they'll say that, you know, you can actually fail to bring a drug to market or fail to fill this, um, fill the clinical trial with enough patients, and that would be a main cause of, of failure. Now, um, does the cost vary with demographics? So here we went to a lot of different firms and asked for their data directly. They didn't give it to us. Um, but we did have um, some success getting data from Research America, which is a nonprofit that queries uh, the U.S. population about how, you know, their views on science and um, on research in general. And here we see some gaps in general, again, where there's lower confidence in research institutions um, among black versus white Americans. Um, there's more mistrust uh, as a reason for not wanting to enroll in trials. And there's a lower uh, just feeling or perception that science in general is uh, beneficial to, uh, to themselves or to their communities versus white Americans. Note, however, that there is um, you know, about 80% of black Americans and 88% of white Americans have actually heard of clinical trials. In, so there is at least a high share of people that know about them, but there is a sense in which you know, science works for some people uh, better, better than others. So here's what we could get in terms of costs, as I mentioned, um, reaching out to contract research organizations and pharmaceutical firms was not um, helpful for us, but we just went to the survey firms that we use all the time to run these survey experiments. Uh, we've blinded their names here, but you can see across the board, it is more costly for these firms, or at least they charge us a higher cost to recruit black versus white respondents across the board. Okay, so um, so in order to, why we gave you these stylized, or why I gave you these stylized facts of the market is because we put these facts into our organizing framework. Um, essentially, the idea here is that we're thinking about a firm that's making a decision about what type of recruitment strategy it wants to run. Basically, does it want to have a representative trial or one that overrepresents white or black individuals and facing different costs associated with those strategies? So our model is essentially that people are going to learn more from samples that look like them. Again, that would be consistent with a broad array of mental models and psychological processes, as well as physician training in something called evidence-based medicine, where physicians are actually um, directed to think about not just what type of problem does your patient have and what is the best evidence available, but how do the patients in that sample look like the patient you're trying to serve. And so a key feature of this model is that all agents use the same model to all doctors and patients to um, update on the efficacy of a drug. Um, but because of the substantial underrepresentation of Black patients in the data, we're going to see higher gains from increasing representation of Black individuals in the data than from white individuals. Um, and then we actually endogenize those costs. So those cost differences that we saw that are across different groups, those are endogenous to the fact that there's been a history of underrepresentation and lower gains um, from bleeding edge technology for one group versus another. Um, so my, my plan had been to skip through these slides, um, but in the, but, uh, I can't, so I'll just I'll <laughs> I'll just go through briefly. So here you can see the the decision of a, a firm who's monopolist in price, um, choosing over different types of recruitment strategy. There's some expected success probability. Um, there's some demand, a markup that goes with the demand. 
um, that's also indexed by tau. And then there's um, the cost that's indexed by tau. And they can the tau comes in at three different types. It can be either representative of the population. There can be black or white overrepresentation. And then this is really where the behavioral component comes in, where our learning model comes in. Um, we're going to assume here that physicians are agents for the patient. So this is a dyad. And the perceived benefit of treatment B hat is something about the actual realized benefit of, tre benefit of treatment B tilde as realized in the trial, plus the expectation or the probability that for me, my BI will equal B tilde depending on my XI or a given characteristic. So in this case, that would be race. So that's really the underlying assumption of similarity-based extrapolation. How much I actually uh, update based on that data is going to be a function of my characteristics. Um, so we have some assumptions on priors and we microfound those, again, for the reasons that I mentioned, evidence-based medicine for the doctors, and learning from similarity um, in the case of the patients. Now, just with this very simple setup, we can come up with three predictions right off the bat. So the perceived benefit of treatment is gonna be increasing in the overall drug efficacy itself, so how effective the technology is. But it's also gonna be uh, increasing in the share of um, my own group that is in the sample. And that's actually holding efficacy constant. And then we also have, again, uh, from this very simple setup, that there's diminishing returns to representation so that the second derivative here um, is negative. And so if you think about it, that just from like a, a very simple, again, hoteling model that we saw before, you know, it's optimal for the firm who's trying to grab as much demand as possible to actually run a representative trial. Be, given that there's diminishing returns, the best they could do is actually be representative and pull in demand from black and white patients and all other types of patients. Remember, they're monopolists in drug type. So if we're just looking at on the benefit side, we would see that uh, VR, the value of running a representative trial, is actually exceeding that of running a white overrepresented trial, which exceeds that from running a black overrepresented trial, just given their proportions in the population. So what are we missing? So we're missing um, the data that I empirically couldn't show you, but proxied for. We're missing the cost, the fact that the cost of recruitment is not constant. And in fact, um, if the cost of running a representative trial was high enough, we could actually get um, a switch in the inequalities that you see there on the bottom, where white overrepresented in terms of profit, net benefit minus cost, would actually switch in favor of um, this, what we see as the status quo. So I think the beautiful part of, um, I guess maybe it was destined for me not to skip this because I actually think what's very neat about this model is that we don't end the discussion there as if the costs just were helicopter dropped from the sky. We actually you know, think about and model how the costs are based on history, who has benefited from these cutting edge technologies in the past, and that actually will raise the cost using the status quo recruitment technology. And that phrase is really important. The status quo, make that will make it um, more, more costly for firms to reach out to um, underrepresented minorities than it will for, uh, for white patients, leading to a cycle of underrepresentation. Okay, so what do we actually do um, with our experiments? So we, we reach out to both physicians and patients. And so I'll walk briefly through these uh, here. Why do, we, why do we reach out to physicians? Well, they're clearly the gatekeepers of prescriptions. They're familiar with evaluating new medications. That's what they do as, uh, as part of their training. You have to, uh, in order to be credentialed as a medical college, you have to go through, you have to have evidence-based medicine. And we're going to focus on diabetes. There's been a lot of new treatments coming online for, for um, type 2 diabetes. And so that will be um, where we're going to uh, focus these drugs. So um, in order to be included, these had to be primary care doctors practicing in the United States. Again, the United States is a lion's a big chunk of the, of the market. They had to not be hospitalists. So they had to actually see patients in an outpatient setting. And um, we had to work with a licensed vendor of the American Medical Association to, to get doctors information. We 
we're interested in heterogeneity from the get-go. So we oversampled um, doctors that worked in both, uh, you know, where a, a larger share of Black individuals lived and a larger share of white individuals lived. So about 50% of our doctors came from um, the former, 25% from the latter, and then 25% from the residual. Um, that's because we wanted variation in who they saw. Remember, for, based on the similarity-based extrapolation, doctors should be thinking about who are my patients when I look at the data. Um, so here's where uh, being a, a MD-PhD can help. So I think it really helped uh, with our recruitment, as well as we paid these doctors $100 for a 15-minute survey. So one of the two um, helped with that outreach. Um, so now, unfortunately, given the distribution, if you remember back to those CDFs, we couldn't use naturally occurring data from clinical trials in this experiment. So we had to generate hypothetical drugs in order to be able to hold the mechanism of action constant and show them, you know, randomized uh, share black in the trial as well as um, efficacy. Um, but we told them it was hypothetical and we incentivized it in, in various ways in order to encourage truth telling. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. But we randomly assigned an efficacy value from a uniform distribution from 0.5 to 2.5% reduction in A1C, which is the measure for um, how you kind of watch your diabetes, uh, manage your diabetes. And then we randomly assigned uh, share black from 0 to 35%. And we oversampled in the lower end of that, uh, in that range, simply because otherwise it just wouldn't have been credible. <laughs> um, and, so, um, and so for everything else, the type of the trial was held constant. The sample size, the fact that it was randomized, um, a randomized controlled trial, everything else was held constant. We just shifted down the percent um, white and increased the percent uh, black randomly, as well as cross-randomized with efficacy. So doctors were shown eight different drug profiles out of a set of in the thousands, once you took all the combinations across mechanism of action and, and drug name and efficacy and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then they had to do two things for us. They had to rate how relevant that drug would be for patients in their care on a scale of zero to 10. And then they would have to tell us if they'd be willing to prescribe that drug for patients in their care for zero to 10. Um, and a few weeks later, we actually went back and we asked them to donate and whether they would want to donate, that's how they would want to split $5 between a recruitment campaign that was focused on increasing just overall sample into clinical trials or to one that was really focused on increasing um, underrepresented minorities. Okay, so on the patient side here, um, of course, you know, why bother with patients? It's the doctors who's the decision makers. That's just not the case. Uh, health is co-produced. So a lot of your job as a physician is trying to persuade, um, you know, persuade patients that this is the right thing to do. And of course, their adherence behavior is what determines whether a drug will have the salubrious effect that um, the data in the trial suggested it would. Also, you know, there is direct-to-consumer advertising in the U.S. It's one of the few countries that allowed that. But we weren't under any false pretenses that patients normally look at clinical trial data. So uh, we did a much simpler experiment and we focused on people that had hypertension simply because there's more of them. So we took black and white patients, we screened them in for hypertension, they had to carry this diagnosis, um, which we verified in the context of, of the survey. Um, and then uh, we asked them a, a few questions just, uh, again, for both of these survey experiments, I should say that nothing about race or diversity or representation was included in the recruitment material. We just said we were interested in their views on medical research. Um, so we had to do a little bit of education about what a trial is, since this wasn't a natural thing for them to commonly do. And we introduced a novel antihypertensive. So for this, because we only needed one drug, we actually didn't, these weren't hypothetical. This was one clinical trial that happened to be, um, for, happened to have two sites, clinical trial sites. And in one site, there was less than 1% black. In another site, there was about 15% black. And just going back to that CDF, 1% black encompasses about a third of all clinical trials that we have in the data. So this is not, um, an unusual or even an outlier observation. 
Um, but we were able to hold efficacy constant because the efficacy was actually the same across uh, these two different sites. We asked about how they thought this drug would perform before and then after randomizing them to either the more representative trial and the less representative trial. And then we had three questions. We asked them to express their posterior beliefs. So how relevant do you think these findings are for you? How efficacious do you think the drug will be for you? And would you be willing to ask your doctor about the medication, which is commonly what you hear at the end of each, of each commercial. Similarly, we had them um, at the end of it, after we had done the randomization, we asked questions to try and get at mechanisms. And to make their answers consequential, we had them um, download a report that they could give to their doctor if they so chose. So of course, with any survey experiments, you worry about experimenter demand and social desirability. We try to introduce consequentiality to these um, experiments. For the doctors, we said that their anonymized um, findings would go into a report to the NIH. 70% want copies of the report, so we are on the line for that. Um, and with, then we verified their responses with their actual donation behavior. For the patients, it really would have been hard for them to intuit what the survey was about. Um, in fact, if I uh, could go to this word cloud, um, uh, I would show you that the most common thing they talk about is blood pressure. That's what you see really prominently because these are all patients that have high blood pressure and they're actually quite intrinsically interested in a drug to treat um, blood pressure. And it would have been hard for them to, within the context of the experiment, kind of figure out what the result, what we were after since we just showed them one, by, one profile of a drug. And about 42% wanted to take these um, take these results to their primary care doctor. Um, so they were also seemed invested in that regard. So it's a randomized trial, so pretty straightforward to, um, again, for the physicians, we are showing them eight profiles and varying representation and efficacy. In our pre-analysis plan, we also controlled, uh, we had fixed effects for mechanisms of action, doctor fixed effects, and um, of course, uh, uh, for the order. For the patient survey, it's even much easier. It's just an indicator variable zero, one, is this a representative trial or not? All right, let's go to the findings. So again, the question is, does this matter? And if so, how much and for whom? So um, let me direct your attention to column two. This is the question on prescribing intention. And again, our numeraire is sort of uh, the efficacy and these are all standardized. So one standard deviation increase in the efficacy of the drug increases the doctor's willingness to prescribe by about 0.23 standard deviation units. And you can compare that to one standard deviation increase in black representation, which increases prescribing tendency by about 0.18 standard deviation units. So that's with no controls. When we add our pre-analysis controls, we see a very um, similar phenomenon conditional on mechanism of action and order fixed effects. And although this first p-value tells you that we can reject that representation has the same effect of efficacy, we cannot reject that representation has about half the standardized effect of efficacy. And in fact, just, you know, if you think about the lead up to this experiment, we were really worried about using efficacy because it seems like such a powerful thing that doctors might anchor on. Um, this actually works better as a figure. So here's that heterogeneity. Remember we, our pre-analysis, we went after doctors and we asked them a little bit about their patient panel. One thing we asked them out of many other questions we asked them about their panel was what share black they saw. We also asked about share women and share elderly and share foreign born. But on the bottom here, we're showing you quartiles of share black and we're just plotting the, um, uh, the effort, the, coefficients, the standardized coefficients. So again, directing your attention to the right-hand side on prescribing in the interest of time, you can see that that looks like a fairly flat line. So efficacy has the same effect on prescribing behavior. It really doesn't seem to matter, um, you know, what is the characteristics of the patient sample. One standard deviation increase in efficacy leads to about a, a 0.2 standard deviation increase in prescribing tendency it's irregardless of whether, you know, how many black patients you see in your own panel. 
It's very different, almost linear. This is non-parametric, but almost linear in representation. And what's really interesting about this is if you look at this um, dot here, those are doctors that really don't see a lot of black patients at all, zero to 10%. And for them, representation doesn't matter. That's not a negative coefficient. That's a pretty precise zero. So over the domain we tested, it just doesn't seem like this is a very salient thing for them at all. But as doctors have more and more black share of patients in their sample, they're more and more attending to this information and it's increasing um, their prescribing for this particular drug. Now, the omnibus test that is linked here below shows that this is only true. It's not true for share female or share elderly. We didn't vary any of that. That was all held constant. So it's really just about um, uh, black patients that, uh, that are in the panel and that are in the sample. This is just some housekeeping um, showing that this, this individual coefficient that we can recover um, correlate on representation correlates very well with the donation behavior of these doctors. What about on the patient side? So what's really interesting to me about the patient side is the patients look a lot like their doctors. So if you remember those doctors that mostly see white patients didn't seem to attend to the samples changing, well, neither do their patients. Um, it's about, uh, you know, it's imprecise, it's 0.17, but not statistically significant. Whereas black patients who are shown a representative, a more representative versus a less representative sample, say that it, it, you know, it's 0.7 A standard deviations more likely to be relevant for their own care. And these are all patients that carry a diagnosis of um, hypertension. What about asking doctor? Here we see some signal. Um, it's positive, but not statistically significant. I'm going to come back to that. And what about just updating in general? Here, again, we see more updating or loading on the efficacy signal among black versus white patients. Um, so coming back to asking your doctor, when we look um, at expected trustworthiness, so this is the patient's expectation of how trustworthy other individuals, including their doctor, would be. And here's where actually we see a, a um, an interaction between our treatment, our representation treatment, and trustworthiness. So it's not enough in this case just to have data that is more representative. You also want to have a good relationship or trust in your physician before you're going to ask them about a new medication. Let me talk a little bit about representation and inequality because I think this is really where we're all headed here. So here, this is not a regression. These are just conditional means. And we bend the efficacy of the, um, of the diabetes treatment on the x-axis. And we're just showing you the raw, um, again, this is the, the mean prescribing intention on the y-axis. So in, uh, we've created PWPs. These are physicians that treat mostly white patients. And what you can see is um, this nice positive uh, slope, meaning that the more efficacious the drug is, the more likely the doctor is willing to prescribe that medication. Well, I would hope that that would be the case. Here's what we see for physicians that treat black patients. So it's a pretty similar slope, but conditional on them seeing non-representative data that we see this is kind of um, shifted downward, sort of a level shift downward in the intercept. Now, when we actually show representative data, we can actually close that gap. And remember part of the Motivation for doing this work was the clinical trial input gap and the prescribing intention output gap. What about on the patient side? So here's um, looking at updating, and this is for low representation. This is loading on the signal, so being within one millimeter mercury of how efficacious that drug was shown to be in the trial itself. And this is a true trial, not something that we um, had to you know, create because the data just didn't exist for us. And this is what happens when we can show them a representative sample. So we can actually close um, the gaps. And again, um, I will show you the priors. I'm sorry if anyone has um, problems, but I think it's, it's worthwhile uh, to look at the priors here. So there's the priors. The priors look very aligned between these two groups. Um, and for white patients, so the, this drug was 15 millimeters of mercury. And you can see they're bang on um, 15, no matter what, low versus high black representation. But it's really important across the entire distribution for black patients um, and again, their doctors 
to have that representative data in order to see themselves in it. Okay. I'm sorry. I I will continue to apologize. Um, okay. But what about mechanisms? Um, so, you know, I think some of these are, you know, could there be heterogeneous treatment effects? Is it related to heterogeneous treatment effects? Actually, nothing we showed them was heterogeneous quite whatsoever. It was just changing the share, holding that efficacy constant. Um, but it could be that maybe there's a perception that, that heterogeneous treatment effects could exist, and that's what's leading to similarity-based extrapolation. It could be that if you see a more representative trial, you feel like that's a signal of a firm that is, you know, more trustworthy. Um, and this is on the doctor side, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, why would representation be important? This was after the gig was up, after we had done our experiment, um, you know, to in instill more confidence in prescribing to all groups. There's a lot of inherent mistrust of the pharmaceutical industry from marginalized and disfran disenfranchised communities. Um, the more medications are studied across a broad array of Americans, the more I can get my patients and myself to trust those meds. On the patient side, you know, um, you know there was this feeling that it, th this was an important thing as well. Um, and I just want to mention that uh, I think extrapolation is just a difficult enterprise in general. Um, so this is showing you uh, for Black patients and physicians that treat Black patients, their response to extrapolating from a sample of white patients to a sample of Black patients with the same condition that's the first panel A. In panel B, this is the same phenomenon for white patients and physicians that treat mostly white patients, extrapolating from a trial that was offshored to, uh, to the US population. And what you can see here is um, almost no one is in that fourth column. There's very few people in the fourth column that are highly confident that results in one sample would extrapolate to another sample. Um, what's also interesting in column one is that um, there's very few doctors who are not at all confident um, that, that they can extrapolate. And maybe that's because, you know, when you have the mechanism of action, you can kind of think, well, maybe this will apply in these other groups, whereas patients tend to be much, um, much more likely to say they're not at all confident. But the point is most people fall in the middle. And this really isn't a feature, or this isn't really a bug of one group or another. It seems to be a feature of just, you know, the difficulty uh, we have in extrapolating. Okay, in the last few minutes, uh, I just want to say that um, we talk about, you know, these costs under the status quo infrastructure, making it uh, more costly to, to recruit, uh, you know, Black patients relative to white patients due to the differential benefit that they had gained in the past. Um, from these uh, technologies. But, um, but you don't really want to end there because um, that um, it's always nice to show when something is feasible. So this is us looking across different conditions. Um, we focus on cancer and HIV AIDS as a sort of a nice comparison because they both have networks, uh, cancer trial networks, HIV trial networks, which the government has invested billions of dollars in. And you can see the median percent black in trials is quite different across different conditions. And it's much, much higher for HIV AIDS than it is for other, um, other conditions, even conditional again on burden of disease or prevalence. And on the right panel, again, this is not causal, this is just an association, but we can see the prescribing rate for new drugs, for drugs that have just come online in the last five years is also much, much higher for HIV AIDS uh, than cancer. So what's going on with HIV AIDS? Um, so one thing they do is they actually recruit at safety net hospitals. So there's two, there's not a one definition of safety net hospitals. One is, you know, getting disproportionate share um, reimbursement rates from Medicare and Medicaid. And another is uncompensated care. But whether you're comparing HIV AIDS to either cancer trials or to Alzheimer's trials in column one and column two respectively, you see that they're just recruiting a lot, lot more in these locations um, where uh, patients that are poor are less, more likely to be on public insurance where they actually exist. And that's a structural thing um, that the community has done. That actually, what we also note is there's a lot smaller difference. I mentioned earlier a difference between 
the median share black in privately funded trials versus publicly funded trials, there's almost no difference in median share black between privately and publicly funded trials. It looks like the, the private firms are really free riding on these um, robust public networks in uh, safety net hospitals that have been developed there uh, do a lot to work like uh, from groups like ACT UP and the Treatment Action Campaign. So, um, so what did we learn in this project? So what I learned is that, yep, representation really matters. I had sat on committees and been in discussions and I wasn't really sure of the evidence base, at least in the context of you know, clinical trials and decisions of doctors and patients. It seems to really matter um, particularly uh, for doctors that treat uh, black patients. But I would, um, I would think again, based on our model and some of the data that we've gathered, that this would be true for, for lots of different groups. But that diminishing returns suggests that it's going to have the most benefit for people that underrepresented in the current moment. It also suggests that policies that can break the cycle of underrepresentation by encouraging um, investment in inclusive infrastructure could have social returns. That's sort of the case of HIV AIDS. And I think it goes back to the initial opening slide that it's it's really, um, in some of the other work it's I've done, we've looked at diversity and like who's making the decisions, who's asking the questions, who determines the labels and the outcomes, and then who is counted. Um, that all is really ma matters um, in terms of trying to reduce inequity. And yes, it might be costly in the short run, um, building relationships actually to do uh, inclusive recruitment takes time. But I think uh, we run the risk of just asking the wrong questions, getting the wrong answers or exacerbating inequality if we don't, uh, if we don't pay those upfront costs. So thank you very much. Sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Okay, is it on? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, Marcella, um, can you talk a little bit um, about basically whether the insurance, um, health insurance in general, and particularly drug coverage, plays any role? So I was thinking, especially if we think about the demographic differences in drug coverage and, I mean, health insurance more generally, I would assume that physicians that especially have a larger share of their patients that come from a population that might have worse drug coverage could take that into consideration when thinking about things like, would I prescribe this drug or would they take it up basically because of course it matters to them. And so what I'm saying is maybe this is even what, what you're describing might be even stronger if we focused on groups that for example, where drug coverage wouldn't matter. Um, and so I was wondering whether you had um, something to say about that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I think um, this kind of falls into, um, you know, demand pull innovation and what are companies thinking about when they're thinking about what conditions to invest in at the at the get go. And there's been some nice work, you know, by Amy Finkelstein and others showing that, you know, when Medicare started to cover different vaccinations, then you saw more investment in vaccines and things like that. So coverage is is clearly important. Um, that being said, I, I, and so I don't want to understate that importance. That being said, I also do think that um, there is a, um, a setup whereby uh, doctors are, you know, get free samples. They have different ways to kind of try and fill in the gaps when necessary, but the ability of them, the, the, um, the, how convinced they are that that's actually going to be helpful and put in that effort cost to try and find those those solutions to fill in the gaps is probably going to be mediated by their confidence that the drug will work and that the patient will want to take it, um, et cetera. So I, um, structurally, Medicaid has decided to start helping cover the costs of trials. So if you participate in a trial, you know, your visits and your labs and things like that. And I think that will structurally help covering new drugs will also help. Um, and then of course, increasing the, the data and the representatives in the database will also, will also certainly play a role. So, yeah. yeah. 
Right. Any question? Okay. Oh, sorry. I, I can start. <laughs> Should I go? Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. I, I have a question. Um, oh, I'm over here. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for the talk. I found it really interesting. Um, I had sort of two questions, I guess. I was wondering, um, one, what you thought about what the implications might be of like thinking about historic inequity, not just in terms of like how that affects the costs of recruitment and differential costs, but also, I don't know what you think about maybe also um, sort of maybe we have more uncertainty about like groups because they've been like historically understudied and whether you think modeling that or, or just whether that phenomenon, I guess, has a big impact on, yeah, thinking about representation. Yeah, that's a very good point. So um, in our model, S is the success probability is also indexed by tau, but we haven't done a lot with that yet. Um, we could. It's just hard to, I mean, anything that um, you can get, you know, we, we focused on cost because we can kind of get where we need to go with that. But yes, if the success probability also was lower in certain groups than other groups, then I think that would just accentuate the findings and, and the incentives that pharma has to go to places where they feel like, you know, they can hold everything else constant and they can really um, have the highest um, ability to see a signal amidst all of the noise, et cetera. Um, of course, I would submit that um, we need to figure out where that lower success probability is coming from. Is it because, you know, there might be stockouts at the pharmaceutical, you know, when they come to try and pick up the experimental drug? Is it because, you know, anyway, those are bigger structural inequalities. That success probability is also endogenous. So, right. Sure. But that would yeah. be a natural place to put it. Thank you. And I guess my second question is what the implications are from your work of like expanding this to think about, I guess, like intersectional representation and yeah. like, and, and I'm guessing like underrepresentation looks a lot worse when you start to look at intersections, but then how do you also think about like recruiting intersectional, like yeah. intersectionally? I think this is really important. And in fact, with the last speaker, um, I, I think, you know, with both um, operations research, as in with agricultural research, as in with clinical medical research, you know, you're seeing this push towards precision to try and make things, you know, really tailored to that individual person. And I think that will just magnify both the importance of having diverse samples um, and, you um, and the need for us to, to try and have better definitions of what we mean by intersectionality. Um, clearly, it's, it's, it's hugely important, but I will say that, um, that of course, there's a power issue as, as soon as you start thinking about, you know, different, different dividing the groups even more finely. So in our one deviation in our pre-analysis plan that I should have noted is that we, you know, wanted to recruit about a thousand patients, um, and we ended up only with 250 before we went to different platforms, and we just couldn't get enough older black people. We could get a lot of older white people, um, but not enough. Um, so we we just had to run with what we had. Um, so there's some signal there, as you see, but um, you know we kind of ran into a problem of representation when doing a study on representation. So just to be honest, but I, I don't think that um, absolves us of it. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about um, population shift. Uh, so I, as we know, like the US population in particular is shifting quickly and like uh, whites might not be the majority by a certain date. So I'm just wondering like as smaller subgroups grow bigger, like what is like, in this clinical trial setting, what is like, uh, like how do you like adapt to, oh, now we need representation from this group because there's more of this group now present in the population and how that cycle or process is? Um, that's a good question. So I think, um, I think this will continue to be a moving target. Um, on the other hand, firms are already offshoring quite a bit 
Um, that and that they're you know they're offshoring to Asia, they're offshoring to Latin America, they're offshoring to Eastern Europe. In fact, one another tragedy of the war in Ukraine is that actually quite a, a lot of clinical trials shut down. Um, so I think it will continue to be uh, sort of a, a, a moving target, but I think it's another sort of unintended consequences of us not having, uh, um, you know, whatever you think about it, insurance, uh, we don't have a national health database in this country that we can query. And so what firms are doing is they're looking for, for example, former um, communist bloc countries that have the infrastructure that have national health registries that they can query or they're going to Israel, you know, as Pfizer did for its. So, um, so I think that's sort of a, a, a national that even with our demographic shifting that we're, we're, we might have a problem with innovation, not just because we're noisy and we have more comorbidities, but we don't actually have a place for firms to quickly figure out um, who would, have, who would qualify um, for, for their trials. Thank you so much. Hello. Um, uh, so I think you might have touched on this a couple of questions ago, um, but uh, I was thinking about the lack of diagnoses um, that is often uh, see where you often see a racial disparity. And I was kind of curious how you um, factored those into your um, how you thought about recruitment strategies. So would you be able to expand on that? I'm sorry, a lack of diagnosis of these various um, oh, conditions right. and yeah. like the racial disparity. There. Yes, that's um, so. Uh, if I understand the question, essentially we're already conditioning on having a condition, mm -hmm. right, or having a diagnosis, which is not going to be evenly distributed across. Yeah, that that's a huge issue. We did. Because of that, we generated population level prescription gaps. So just prescribing a new drug per, you know, per thousand black population or per th thousand white population. And as you kind of intuit, the gaps are wider because of lack of access to care. Hello. Th thanks for a great talk. Um, one concern that I had was about the side effects in where, where I'm from that were uh, the minority group were a little bit afraid of being uh, sterile after taking COVID medication, for instance, that that was a story that, that was in the news media. Uh, could you could you comment on maybe side effects in general and maybe differential information access as a different uh, story? Yeah. Um, so again, going back to that, uh, to the um, two talks ago, um, you know, the uncertainty that exists um, um, in the market. So, um, so I think I think um, oftentimes when I present this, people think that because I'm also a physician, they think I know something, and I'm not telling them. Like, you know, the answer to whether there are side effects that are differential across this dimension or that dimension, and I'm withholding it from them in some way. And the truth is medicine is an inexact science, and we don't often know even the mechanism of action. So we can't say for sure that things will work in a patient as it was demonstrated in the trial. And that's pretty much true universally, but it's more true <laughs> the fewer studies and the fewer data we have on certain groups of people. Um, that that being said, um, I think the ability to assuage fears, to clarify when, you know, a lot of misinformation is incentivized, there's a profit to be made from misinformation. So it's always going to be with us. So the ability to quell those falsehoods that are clearly falsehoods and to recruit patients more easily, I think that's all going to be facilitated by a more diverse workforce, that a workforce that I, you know, that is from the community, that identifies with the population it serves, um, that can have those discussions. And um, I think that's still going to be a, a really important feature, even if we don't have funds and nothing in our data suggests we would even need to do this 
to carry out, you know, a fully powered trial to test whether heterogeneous treatment effects indeed exist. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, towards the beginning, you showed that there were um, like this set of costs from doing a representative uh, trial and then also like this set of benefits. And you said there's this inequality here where oftentimes the costs are outweighing the benefits for firms. Um, but that like that, you know, could possibly be flipped. I'm curious, like, what do you think would need to change for um, like for profit groups or firms to be incentivized to do representative trials? Um, I'm not sure that, um, yeah, there needs to be incentives or regulation, one or the other. This is not something that they will naturally um, arrive at. Uh, I have been invited and then quickly canceled to go and talk to pharmaceutical firms. Um, yeah, it was almost embarrassing. Like they had the whole Zoom information in my picture and then all of a sudden they I think someone did some background research and, and <laughs> so, you know, we're not going to like what she has to say. Um, so I think, I think despite all the discussion of, you know, DEI and diversity and the websites, just take them, look at the data, like it's not changing. And, um, and when they produce the, when they actually produce their own profiles on this, it's, they're making you know, they're cutting the data in ways that are really disingenuous to suggest that they are represented. Why did Moderna do it? Well, um, they had advanced purchase agreements worth $1.5 billion. They had an oversight committee that pushed them. So um, I think, you know, you could do carrots. You could say, look, you're going to get your trial, um, uh, you're going to get your drug uh, reviewed quicker at the FDA if you do this. Um, or you can do sticks, or you can do a combination. Um, but I think, but I think, uh, you know, I, I think this does require infrastructure. This does require a fixed cost. This does present the opportunity to free ride. So I think to expect the market to just deliver on this in and of itself is unrealistic. Hi, um, you made some comments that the results you found. Depend, so the doctor's behavior dependent on their patient profiles. Do you think that also means that uh, patients going to doctors that don't usually see patients similar to them get different treatments? The patient. Um, I, I interpret your question as whether is, are you asking about like implicit bias or yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is all layered on top of, um, of that. And I think, uh, um, you know, patients sort, uh, and, and doctors sort. And so this is, this is all kind of, um, in the background of what we're doing. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for just one more question. Oh. Um, I just had a really quick question. I know you mentioned that the doctors received a hundred dollars for a fifteen-minute survey. So, how much were the patients compensated? I, I guess specifically like minority patients, like for trials that would normally not come in. How much are the are are patients normally compensated in trials or in this trial? I guess in this trial and normally. Yeah. In this trial, they're paid by the online platform with some top up from us. And I think it's somewhere in the range of probably seven to ten dollars. Um, so quite a bit less than the doctors because um yeah, doctors are really hard to get to answer questions. Um uh but um but in general, you know, it's been really interesting to see this debate about using incentives financial incentives to increase, for example, differential compensation rates across groups to increase uh, representation. And for a really long time, um, the uh, IRB, and there's a federal sort of version of a um, that oversees all the IRBs, um, had really come up strongly against that, thinking that it was um, kind of undue influence to, to um, 
and this actually goes back to, you know, the history of our blood supply and everything like that, um, where, you know, if you paid people, they'd be worried about selecting individuals that had um, diseases and couldn't screen for those diseases. And so, like, there's a long history of, of financial payments in, in um, medical research. But more recently, people are starting to understand that there are structural barriers for people to actually get to these um, trials, to these visits, transportation, time off work, parking, et cetera, and they're not equally distributed. It's also been clarified that the IRB should really be thinking about whether independent of financial rewards, a, a, a trial is ethical to run. Is it, are we in a position of equipoise? Um, and that, and so that has led to, I think, a re, you know, a reimagination of, you know, what types of compensation could look like and allowing for the fact that, you know, we shouldn't be thinking about everything about, you know, benchmarking it to the shadow wage. We should be actually thinking about the time cost, what other things people have on their mind, um, and the structural barriers for them to participate and, and trying to alleviate that in any way possible, including financial. All right, I think that concludes the keynote, but we have a break with coffee, so hopefully Marcela will be around um, and maybe she could answer more questions there. But let's thank her once again. Thank you so much for coming thank here. You.